Thank you, Bridget. Uh, All right. I am going to call to order this meeting of the Hamilton County Board of County Commissioners. It's a staff meeting, October 27th, 2020. Um, before we get started, I do want to acknowledge uh, that Corporal Adam McMillan passed away on Friday. Um, he had been in the hospital for a couple of weeks and we had extended our sympathies and our prayers to him and his family. And as you know, he passed. And so I have asked the Sheriff's Office to come in on Thursday so that we can acknowledge uh, not only his passing, but his service to the county. I'm gonna ask everybody to mute. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanna acknowledge the corporal's service and have someone that knew him well from the sheriff's office come in and just talk about him. And so we'll have a resolution to acknowledge the service and his passing. Uh, but anyway, that, that will be coming as a presentation on Thursday. Um, so the, on our agenda today, uh, we've got the Hamilton County Soil and Water Conservation District Stream Bank Stabilization um, program in front of us. John Nelson was going to present, but he is tied up at the moment. So Adam Lehman is going to present in his stead. And Adam, I'm going to ask you to go back to your first slide so that we can pick up from the beginning. And Commissioner, I was able to make it. Oh, there you are. All right. Hi, John. How are you? Doing well, Madam President. Good, good. Thank you for joining. Um, yeah, this is a really interesting program, really important. So um, thank you for being with us, and we're anxious to see the presentation. All right. Uh, thank you so much for having us, and uh, thank you so much uh, to all the commissioners and you, of course, Madam President, for your support uh, for the Soil and Water Conservation District and for conservation in general. Um, so we're really happy to report about our stream bank stabilization and the life staking project that we've undertaken for the last two years uh, here in, in Hamilton County. Um, so I just wanna go through the various processes of how we work on, on uh, these life staking projects. And then I'll uh, have Adam come and talk a little bit about the technical side of these things. Um, so basically, um, stream bank erosion is a common problem. I think everyone of us has, has received a call on, on a matter like that, uh, either because uh, a homeowner is losing a part of their property because the stream is eroding their property, or it, it, it is, uh, the stream is uh, by a public infrastructure where the infrastructure is being damaged because of stream erosion, um, so the stream bank erosion. Um, so what we decided to do was uh, involve volunteers uh, from our community to help with this problem. Um, so the first step is to, of course, stabilize the stream banks. And the best way to do it is by planting trees. Trees work well to stabilize stream banks. So the more trees uh, that you plant in the riparian area of a, a uh, stream, the stabler the stream bank is. And when you have peak flows uh, where streams are, are swelling, uh, they don't er erode the, the stream bank. Um, so what we did, decided to do, and it was all Adam's leadership here, uh, was we decided to involve volunteers to go and harvest live stakes or tree cuttings from existing streams. So uh, Adam, if you want to um, kind of go through the slides there. So these were a live stakes look like. They're just tree cuttings um, like uh, you would. And we usually do this in the colder months. Uh, in uh, January, February. So you'll see us all wearing warm clothes over there. So we go and harvest these uh, from, from sandbars within our stream. So this is actually in the Great Miami River out in Coleraine Township. So you can see all the volunteers. This is of course post uh, pandemic world. So that's why uh, we're all in close quarters there. Um, I'm sorry, pre pandemic. Pre -pandemic yeah. uh, so we're in close quarters there. This was in early, I believe in January, uh, February timeframe. Um, so there you can see our, our volunteers. We had about 50 that day that harvested uh, live stakes uh, from a sandbar. And uh, oftentimes these sandbars are not accessible by foot. So we'll actually use canoes to get volunteers across the, the stream to the sandbars uh, where they'll begin harvesting these live stakes uh, for the sake of um, later um, installing them on stream banks. 
Um, of course, after we harvest them, we can't immediately plant them because we want to wait for the warmer months to plant them. So at that point in time, the big issue is how do we store them? And they, be, they have to be stored in cooler temperatures. So we actually uh, partnered with Rheingeist Brewery who let, them, who let us use their walk-in coolers to store the steaks in cooler temperatures till we were ready to install them. Uh, and so they let us use it uh, to where we kept it in, I think, in their coolers till April, um, May uh, timeframe. Um, and then we pulled it out, of course, by the time we were in pandemic time. And so we couldn't do a large gathering of people like we did for the harvesting uh, in order to install the stakes. Um, so we did it through social distancing. So we had people pick up um, the, the stakes and the tools in a touchless environment uh, where they would just email us, tell us how many volunteers were going. And usually the volunteers were family groups that were already in contact with each other. So they were not gathering large groups of people from different households. And they would borrow the tools, they would borrow the stakes, and then they would go and install the stakes on the stream banks. And we were able to harvest and plant nearly 3,000 live stakes, so 3,000 wow. trees potentially on our stream banks. And uh, though we harvested the, the live stakes uh, from the Great Miami River, we, were, we planted them in GMR, we planted them in Little Miami River, we also planted them in the Mill Creek. So uh, they went all across the county, uh, providing stream bank stability to all these streams. Uh, if there's no other questions about the process and what we did here, I'm going to go turn it over to Adam to kind of talk a little bit about the technical aspects of this. Hey, John, I, yes, I know this sounds like a crazy question, but you're saying live stakes. Are they, what, what are they? Are they trees? <laughs> They're tree cuttings, right? So think about a tomato cutting. Really, oh, any plant okay. you can kind of trim off a stem and in the right conditions, you can plant it and it'll take root and become an huh. individual plant. And so, so I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So it's important that these cuttings come from the side of another stream. It, that ensures that it is an appropriate species. And that's, that's critical when we need a species that has a root structure that's really going to hold these, mm -hmm. these banks together in the future. Uh -huh. so, so you plant them and they're going to root and, and grow into trees. Yeah. So basically we planted 3,000 trees, right? That's it's a lot more efficient to plant these things than actual trees. So, um, you know, we can really get some impressive numbers. And I'll say, you know, we're ramping up quick. And I, I would expect those numbers, those annual numbers to grow significantly. Mm -hmm. So is this a, um, a normal procedure or is this you guys being creative? This is a typical stream restoration kind of thing um, that's often done in, in a professional engineering environment. So the, the volunteer aspect, kind of crowdsourcing the, the solution is, is somewhat not. Cool. Yeah. That, that, that's my reply. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's move on to Adam for the technical pieces. Yeah, I, I don't know how technical it is. I kind of want to step back and just add some context about, about you know, the, the scope of the issue first and kind of circle back to this and some other programs that we're doing to address it. I like this figure. I'm not going to dig into the model. Don't worry. It's, it's just a, a good backdrop to make this point, you know. So I think the, the commission or in past commissions have been um, aware of some high profile issues we've had, particularly in Anderson Township associated with Dry Run and Clough Creek. You know, we right now we've just had a, a multifamily building. It's like 12 units that has had to be abandoned. Um, you know, a few years back, we've had a high profile um, situation where some folks had their, their leach fields in jeopardized, right? And they were, you know, close to having their houses, con you know, condemned until that, that situation was fixed. So these can be some quite serious problems for landowners, and, and it's a widespread problem. I, this morning, I was at a, a consult. I do free consultations to local landowners to, to 
you know, help them with manage things like this. I do about 50 of those a year. So it's a widespread problem, but it's also kind of beyond the dispersion. It is a threat to public infrastructure, right? And we can point to some really impressive information uh, published by uh, our forward-looking thinkers, or forward-looking thinking neighbors across the, the river. SD1 um, worked with their consultant and, and published this, this data that said, that found basically that in Boone County, the cost of insufficient stormwater management, and that's what this is. This is a stormwater management problem, right? Because we're managing our stormwater uh, to mitigate against floods. More recently, Ohio EPA regs have kind of put in some water quality components to that, but we are doing nothing, to be clear, to, to manage the impact of this stuff on stream stability. And they've quantified the cost of that to roads alone in Boone County at twenty-five dollars to $50,000 per square mile of watershed per year, right? So this stuff has, has price tags, and I think that, that typically gets overlooked as this is regular infrastructure maintenance, when really, you know, the lifespan of this infrastructure could be lasting a lot longer um, if, if we were managing our, our storm water uh, more effectively. Um, but one more point to make here is this is, you know, that stormwater <coughs> issue is simultaneously the number one thing that's impacting the biology of our local stream. Right? We know this because we have this incredibly uh, high uh, quality data set that MSD has commissioned um, in association with the consent decree. Um, and so, you know, while I hope that everyone is concerned about the ecological integrity of our streams for its own sake, I would, I would point out that, you know, in, in 1972, the Clean Water Act stated that states are to, you know, designate uses for their streams, um, and then bring those streams into compliance, right? And about 70, 65% of our streams are not in compliance with their aquatic life use, right? Meaning the, the, the biology is out of whack. And it's because this is the most foundational and widespread cause of that. And I would just say that at some point, we can expect US EPA to say, you know, look guys, we know that you haven't been able to do this in the past. This has been an overwhelming problem. We've given you 50 years to get your hands around it. And at some point, they're going to say, Ohio EPA, you need to start bringing your streams into attainment. And when that happens, you can bet that they're going to be, you know, pushing it down to the local jurisdiction. So that's kind of my who cares feel. Um, so what, what are we doing about it? You know, John gave uh, one, one example. This is kind of an example on the other end of the spectrum, right? My mission is to improve stream health in Hamilton County. And when I look at such a ubiquitous problem that is kind of out of you know, my control to fix, I say, well, how am I gonna do this? So what I've done is I've created, the, I've, I've kind of built a collaborative, the Cooper Creek Collaborative with the idea that, you know, we need to get our head around how much hydraulic mitigation is necessary to actually achieve these, these goals, these biological goals. And so we've, we've all come together and said, we are gonna sustain focused effort on hydrologic mitigation within a one square mile area until the job's done, until we, our in-stream or hydrologic objectives are met. And so we've had a ton of support in the community for this. Every water resource manager knows this is the big question. And so we've got, you know, four different labs that get US EPA working with us. You can see all our partners, you know, health and, and um, planning and development have been huge, huge partners in this. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're a few years into this, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna we, we've just, I think, funded like our fifth project. Uh, it's gonna take, you know, I think the next, five years or so, we're either going to see progress or we're going to step back and say, wow, you know, we, we need to reassess and figure out what we need to do to get our hands around this problem. So that's kind of uh, one aspect of this. And, and that is, you know, how are we going to restore our watersheds, our, our you know, using green infrastructure? And, and how are we going to deal with, you know, really the results of 
years and years of development without regard to hydrologic consequences, right? Um, and so that, that's a really exciting project that, that we're working on. That's, that's um, a, a priority for us. But the other, the other side of this that we're looking at is, is what John just gave an example of. And that is, all right, we need to look to the streams. We're, we need to retrofit our landscapes, but we also need to kind of get our hands around the actual erosion problems that we're dealing with now. Um, how, how is this typically done? It's typically done with natural channel design stream restoration at a price tag of $250 a foot, right? This is not scalable, right? We, we, we cannot do that to, to every stream in Hamilton County. Um, so the idea is how can we uh, build the capacity to do this in a, in a scalable manner? The live stakes are one example. Um, John uh, kind of nailed that one. Uh, I'll just give one other example because um, I think we're, we're running out of time here. And that is we're, we're looking at large woody debris installations, right? So the idea of the live stakes, we're getting trees rooted in the banks. They're holding it together. But, you know, we still we have to slow down these flows, right? Because there were trees in these banks before they got tore up, right? But there are unnatural flows coming down. And what are we going to do about that? So. Cooper Creek, we're looking at what we can do to the landscape to reduce those. A really critical thing, uh, aspect of tree, of streams with stream ecology for sure, um, but also it, it, it is underappreciated the role that wood in streams plays uh, on the hydraulics of it, right? Typically people see this stuff and they're like, oh, we got to clear it out. We got to get this water out of here. Let's, let's pull out all the woody debris. Most of our public works departments are doing this on a regular basis. And the problem is that, you know, these, these, the wood in these streams is probably the largest component to hydraulic resistance, right? So it slows down the flows uh, and in such reduces the erosivity of those flows. And so this is something that we can do without getting permits from the state um, and, and without hiring engineers. And so we're not just, uh, you know, so right now we're, we're going to implement a pilot project uh, in Cooper Creek doing this, but it's, it's also going to be a capacity building training event. We're bringing an, an engineer from Sustainable Streams who has tons of experience doing this. And, he, and we're going to invite water resource managers from all over Southwest Ohio to come and get training in this. We're going to have some of our most dedicated volunteers. And then we can just go out taking wood that's existing, lying, you know, dead trees in the floodplain, drag them in, install them in an informed and stable manner. And, you know, once we do that throughout the system, then we can start to, to you know, really reduce the erosivity of those flows in stream. Obviously, in conjunction with green infrastructure on the landscape and, and getting uh, woody vegetation growing in our banks again. So that's, uh, any, any questions? Um, do you know how many streams are in Hamilton County? I think I have a, a, uh, a number of square footage that I don't know off the top of my head, but an absurd amount, right? I mean, people don't realize right. Crazy. You know, what is considered a stream and what is a jurisdictional stream that is regulated by the state. So, you know, that little ditch in your, as, as a rule of thumb, if there is not terrestrial vegetation growing on the bottom of the bed, that is a, a jurisdictional stream. It's a water of, of the United States. Um, roadside ditches don't count, but, you know, it, it's a lot. They're everywhere. I wish I, I had a map right now that I could pull up and just so we could see the blue lines, but I don't, I'll, I'll respect the commission's time. Okay. All right, Commissioner Summer. Um, yeah. I could just ask a question for myself. Uh, in general, when you talk about hydrologic mitigation, it's not specifically for streams, but it could be any body of water. When I say hydrologic mitigation, I'm speaking to the fact that in our urban environment, we have altered the hydrology, right? Mm -hmm. So the water is, is 
blowing off these impervious surfaces super fast, and that's creating highly erosive flows in the stream. Mm -hmm. It's also, you know, an equally uh, important side of that that we need that uh, pertains to the biological integrity and in the regulatory issues I spoke about, is mm -hmm. that when, when the water's not infiltrating into the ground, it's not recharging the groundwater, and our streams, are, our, our smaller headwater streams are going dry. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. is a huge problem. We talk about how many streams there are. Mm -hmm. About 85 to 90% of our streams are what we call uh, headwater streams, meaning they, they drain less than um, 20 square miles. And that's mm -hmm. just kind of the nature of a branching system, right? And so mm -hmm. when you have a huge proportion of that huge proportion going dry, that is not like habitat degradation. That is a loss mm -hmm. of aquatic uh, habitat. And, you know, that's, that's a hard, hard problem to get our hands around. But, you know, one day we're, you know, chickens are going to come home to roost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you look at, say, the Ohio River, um, hydrologic, hydrologic mitigation would be something different than just a normal small stream, of course, because it's a larger mass of water, but would you call it the same thing? Absolutely. And I, okay. The hydrology is not just in the water, right? The uh -huh. hydrology is on the landscape. It's the rain, it's, it's mm -hmm. the infiltration. Okay. So I, most hydrologic mitigation happens mm -hmm. on the land. Think green infrastructure. Okay. Um, the large woody debris, that, that helps. And, and, and you made a great point. We would not rec do large woody debris in larger streams. Mm -hmm. First of all, there's a navigability component. Second of all, um, it's just a, a logistical Too issue. Too massive. What, what yeah. are you gonna get to hold, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Madam President, if, yeah. if I could just uh, briefly um, so uh, some of the background in terms of this particular presentation today, um, the administration holds uh, a staff meeting every two weeks where we bring the, the county leadership team together uh, and just keep track of, of the, uh, the items on the administration's work plan, which is a funnel down from the board's policy agenda. Um, John is a, is a member of that, of that county senior leadership team uh, Soil and Water Conservation District obviously falls outside of the Board of County Commissioners, but nonetheless, we have several agencies like that um, where the, the leadership of that team serves uh, directly on the senior leadership team of the county, be it Soil and Water Conservation District, Public Health, HCDC, those types of organizations. And this is the type of project uh, that on every uh, week basis, uh, John will keep uh, the rest of the senior leadership team apprised of. Uh, to look for, uh, number one, just to keep the broader team informed, but also to look for areas where uh, there may be um, uh, coordination opportunities uh, between, say, community planning, uh, the Metropolitan Sewer District, public health, uh, environmental services, et cetera. Um, and one of the, and John and I talked about um, bringing this item forward at some point, really from the perspective that, again, as we talk about the county telling its story and what are the things that the county is involved in, you know, a lot of people, you know, they know the sheriff's office, they know we do elections, but do a lot of people understand that the county has several departments and organizations geared almost entirely to environmental preservation and protection, whether it's uh, stream bank restoration, like we've talked about today, or erosion control, hillside stability, recycling solid waste, air quality, a huge aspect of county programming that touches so many different residents and, um, and people in this county uh, doing really great things like uh, what John and Adam talked about today that a lot of people just are, are not aware of. And the amount of what, this is one big project, um, but the amount of, of technical assistance they provide on a day in and day out basis to people who call and say, hey, my slope is sliding uh, in the backyard or the involvement they have with developers on keeping soil stabilized on development sites. Uh, they're a big, soil and water is a big part of the, of the development process and just the overall work that the county does from an environmental perspective. So I just wanted to give them the opportunity today to talk a little bit about what they do. And perhaps we have them back at a future date just to talk a little bit more about the organization uh, broadly and some of the other things uh, that they're doing. Yeah, thank you for the background, Jeff. Yeah, so would you say that um, we're getting better at the upstream development 
uh, in order that we don't need to do all these kinds of things maybe in the future because the water will be captured either you know on, on the flat land as opposed to draining into these systems no I, I unfortunately i wouldn't and i think it's a it's it's within the county's purview to improve that right so i would say that that we, we again let we can look towards our forward-looking neighbors to the south sd1 has some different uh detention regulations than we do and they really are no more onerous on the developmental community it's just that they actually uh they, they actually require them to think and design that outflow structure in your detention basin to try to reduce stream bank erosion and not just to, to meet the, the, the water quality requirement and to meet the flooding requirements. And so one thing I do, you know, in our demonstration watershed, um, we're, we're doing like, we're, we've targeted uh, 10 different detention basins that we're retrofitting. And all we're really doing is just reconfiguring that outfall um, with really minor changes that just allow it to kind of hold back, uh, hold back some of the smaller events for longer. Because what, what causes these erosive events is really, it's not these huge, huge uh, floods that happen. It's the higher frequency of, of erosive flows, right? So for example, at, at the, the, the main difference in the regulations at SD1 is that they have to, um, they have to, Re de detain 40% of the two-year storm event. So that's kind of the size event that they're saying everything above that can just keep going out like it does. But that that's kind of medium-sized rain event. We're just going to hold it back for 24 hours. And it doesn't require larger areas typically to achieve that. And so that's something that planning and, develop and development could, could take upon themselves and update those regs. Um, and so that would stop the bleeding going forward, right? Um, and I'll, I'll take this chance to say that, you know, the, the, the one real and only solution to this is the one that the commission's already looking at, and that's the impervious surface based fee structure. And I would just say to that, that, you know, when that does come to your desk, a really important consideration to that is going to be um, you know, incentivizing uh, people to, to install green infrastructure. So that dollar amount has to be sufficient, right? If you have an incentive program and it doesn't incentivize people to make changes, then, you know, it was all for nothing. But that's really, that's the silver bullet. That's the only thing that can reach this entire landscape. Because that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about a problem here and there. We're talking about ubiquitous, problem covering the entire landscape. Yeah, well that, that is part of the conversation around impervious surfaces. Um, and I was gonna ask Jeff if we could make sure that um, some of what has been discussed here today is kind of rolled into that conversation when we talk about incentives and some strategies for uh, people that own large surface area but would prefer to not pay a larger fee, rather change that and um, make it greener so that there is not as much outflow from that surface. So yeah, I think this commission would agree with you moving in that direction, but maybe we need to ramp that conversation up a little bit. I, I haven't been in those meetings, so I don't know, um, but just to make sure that it's part of what's being talked about. Yeah, Commissioner, it absolutely is a, is a part of that work. And as Adam said, I mean, to have an impervious surface fee uh, with only a charge, um, is, is really just a financial mechanism. The, the real impetus for change there are, is, is incentivizing people to do something different to avoid that fee. Mm -hmm. um, and that is things like installing green infrastructure, et cetera. Otherwise, there is, without it, there's certainly an equity. You're solving part of the equity problem by making sure that the people that are producing that outflow of stormwater are paying for it as opposed to the people who are, are creating the, the water going through the wastewater system. But what you're really trying to do here is, is for a change and an improvement to the environment. And that's where things like the, the incentive programs come into place. And we're absolutely, we'll, we will absolutely be considering those in the context of that program as we bring it forward to you. What, what is the status on that, Jeff? Uh, we've had, uh, I believe we've had the kickoff meeting 
uh, on that uh, just recently with uh, the second uh, stakeholder group that's been pulled together. Um, so I, I can get the board the, the, the forward looking timeline at this point. It's okay. actively in process. I just don't have the timeline off the top of my head, but I can get the board the timeline in terms of when we expect to come back to you with the report. Okay, that'd be great. And Madam President, uh, the Soil and Water Conservation District is actually one of the agencies in the agency group of the ISF task force as well. So um, we really appreciate the commissioners getting us involved in that as well. Um, but to Adam's point, yes, you know, uh, if, if we look at the pre-regulation Hamilton County and, we're, and where we are at now, we've made a lot of improvements, uh, but could we, make, could we do more Absolutely, we can do a lot more. We're doing a good job, but we could definitely do a lot more for sure. And Madam President, I was just going to comment from what Adam and John has said that we're we're basically volunteer voluntarily doing things, but the mandate may come down uh, that we have to do some things because it's been a while since the mandate was given to the county, um, and so we need to kind of speed up on what we're doing before we're mandated. Uh, to do more. So I was just wondering if either of you guys are on the impervious uh, feed committee. Yes, ma'am, I am. You are? Okay. Okay. Good. That's all I have. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for the presentation. I uh, appreciate it. And yeah, we're looking forward to that um, that task force coming forward with recommendations. So that was part of the larger affordable <laughs> affordability task force. Um, and I think that's the last one uh, that we have to address. So Jeff, if you could provide us with that time frame, that'd be really helpful. Be happy to. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all. Thanks for the presentation. I, I want to say that, you know, if you need more volunteers, feel free to call in warmer months. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we put them in the cooler. So we're not putting our volunteers in the water anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's nothing wrong with utilizing Ryan guys. They love that idea. Um, so, okay. Well, thank you for being with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so that concludes the regular portion of our agenda. We do have an exec session. Um, does anybody have anything else for the good of the order? I have nothing. Madam President, if, yeah. if I could just very briefly, um, I wanted to, because we are winding into the final stages of our, uh, of the CARES Act, uh, CARES Act, um, the deadline for spending those dollars um, without an extension from the federal government is December 30th. Um, so we are still very much hoping uh, that, um, uh, that wisdom will prevail and that people will get together in, in DC and uh, provide local governments and states across the country with an extension on the timeline with which to spend the money that was already allocated. I think it would be one of the easiest, quickest, and most cost-effective things that could be done to extend the benefit of those dollars and make sure they're getting into the hands of the, of the, of the community and the people that desperately need, need assistance because of the pandemic. But recognizing we can't absolutely count on that. Um, we are uh, continuing to ramp up the program uh, and, the, and the, the CARES Act programming that the board is authorized. Uh, and there's going to be likely a lot of stuff uh, coming forward over the next couple of weeks as we look to, uh, you know, this has been a sprint since April 27th, I think, when we received the dollars. We've been, we were in a ramp up phase. Um, and now that we've hit the um, kind of the culmination of the ramp up phase, we are sprinting downhill towards that December 30th uh, finish line. Um, if we get an extension, great, but if we don't, um, we need to be prepared to, to get these dollars out the door. So there's a lot of stuff that's gonna be coming forward. Um, I just wanted to highlight some of those. Um, the, we had talked about a contract with the CBB. I think the board has individually uh, seen a, a preview of the marketing campaign that the CBB is, is working on. That contract, uh, will be coming forward to the board here shortly. Um, we are looking to do a, a rent, an, assist, an agreement for rental assistance with a fourth provider so that we can get that rental assistance money out into the community quicker. Um, we're gonna bring that contract forward uh, shortly. Um, the contract with the Community Action Agency for rapid reemployment services, that will be coming forward. Um, the, uh, the proposals for Wi-Fi are due this Friday. So there'll be a resolution coming forward shortly. 
uh, to allow um, myself as administrator to sign off uh, on those grant agreements as they are approved and deemed eligible. Uh, the arts grant uh, was due last Friday. Uh, I believe we got 59 applications, just about using up the entirety of that $3.5 million allocation. Uh, so there will be a, uh, an agreement or a resolution coming forward, uh, allowing me to sign off on, on those as well. Um, Joy and Holly are in conversations with multiple organizations on the youth programming, uh, specifically around uh, costs de dealing with um, uh, community or uh, after school learning programs, et cetera. I know they're talking with several uh, specific organizations on scholarship assistance for, for uh, kids to participate in those programs. So we may uh, have some of those come coming before uh, the board as well. Um, we have, um, there are a couple of other items that have come to the administration's attention that we're gonna be talking to the board about, including uh, the uh, a request from the Regional COVID uh, Communication Center, which operates out of the chamber uh, to uh, continue to enhance our communication message to um, the community on COVID-19 and some small business assistance uh, through the Port Authority and the Urban League uh, that have come to our attention, as well as some requests for making upgrades uh, to uh, the Duke Energy Convention Center to uh, ameliorate uh, COVID-19 impacts as well. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that's gonna start to fly really quickly here. Uh, and Holly and I will do our best to keep the board up to speed on all these individual um, items, but please um, ask if you have any questions um, I just wanted to make sure the board knew that this is going to start to happen pretty quickly here as we as we uh, gear towards uh, December 30th, and we'll just do our best to keep you uh, updated on those as they come forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks to the team as always for all the work. I know it's a big flurry here towards the end. Um, mm -hmm. And speaking of COVID, um, as folks might know, we're in danger of going into the purple zone on the governor's map on Thursday. So Greg Kesterman will be speaking to this tomorrow at the briefing, but we are very close to that. And I think the fear is that we may go into purple. And you know, the question is asked all the time, well, what does that mean? Well, to the language on the governor's website, it means that it is a se it's severe exposure and spread only leave home for supplies and services. That's what it means. Uh, and it means anything more than that, only if the governor decides that it does. And so uh, no county has been in the purple before. And so um, there have been no added regulations related to that, but that could happen at some point in the future. So I think you know, we need to be ever vigilant. Um, unfortunately, we've got folks in our community who are not masking, they are not staying away from one another, they've let their guard down and uh, our numbers are going up. So I just wanted to you know, highlight that. It's not much of a highlight really, but, um, but you know, that may happen on Thursday. And then we'll have to continue to message out to people that you know, this is serious business. We're losing people in this community and um, the rate of infection is increasing. So it's nothing but bad news on that front. Mm -hmm. So, but, but the good news is that the CARES Act dollars are really helping out mm -hmm. where the needs are. And so thank you, Jeff, again, to you, Holly, and the team for doing that. Mm -hmm. I have news. Yes. Um, well, I was delighted to see that Metro is going to provide free transportation mm -hmm. on election day to the polls. Right. I, I, I think that's neat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is. And, and to remind people, you can vote any day from now until election day. Yep. Because BOE is now open on weekends. So yeah, people should remember, make a plan and vote early. Um, vote. Yeah, go vote. Go vote. Go. You can catch the bus. <laughs> and catch the bus on election day. All right, very good. Well, thank you all. Um, if we have nothing further, I'm going to move that we go into executive session pursuant to RC section 121.22 G3 to conduct a conference with an attorney to discuss imminent litigation. Second. Commissioner Driehouse? Yes. Commissioner Summer Dumas? Yes. Commissioner Parks? Yes. Thank you.